Okay, the next thing we need to do now is to bring these two streams together into a reactor. Now, there's a number of ways we could do this. If we look at the palette of tools here, we can see here we have something called a mixer. Now, one has to be very careful when using a mixer. The Unisim operation of a mixer effectively adds together two streams and in doing so performs an energy balance to work out what temperature the material comes out at and what its physical properties are. The confusion that can arise is that so far all the items that we've placed on our flow sheet are mechanical items of equipment. A mixer for two gas streams is not going to be a mechanical item of equipment. You're simply bringing two pipes together and there might be some sort of swirl inducer or turbulence inducer in the entry section of our reactor. And so for those who are not too experienced, they tend to look at a mixer and then draw it as a significant unit operation on their process flow diagram. I don't want you to get into that habit. I want you to think what it is you're bringing together. If you've got two liquids you're bringing together that have miscibility problems, you will actually need a tank with an impeller or some other means of mixing those two liquids together. Two gas streams in turbulent flow, such that we've got on this flow sheet here, don't need any physical unit to mix them together. And so I'm not going to bring the two streams together in the mixer. I'm just going to simply introduce both streams into a reactor unit operation. Now, we defined a conversion reaction. In order to use that conversion reaction, we need a conversion reactor. Now, that conversion reactor can be found just on this menu of general reactors here that I've highlighted on the palette. So I single left click general reactors, a new palette opens up, and the middle option here is a conversion reactor that hatched icon there with a C next to it. So I'm going to single left click that and drag it onto the flow sheet. In doing so, I'll see that the unit operation is red. It needs calculating. And I'm going to double left click on it to see what it needs. OK, so the traffic light system here says requires a feed stream. Well, we've got two feed streams we can give it, and so we will do. E102 out, that's my steam, and E105 out, which is my methane. So there are the two feeds into my reactor. Now, note that I have the option of supplying an energy stream to this reactor. Now, I'd supply an energy stream if, for example, I had a mechanical piece of equipment that was transferring heat in this unit operation. For example, I might have in a liquid phase reaction some heating coils within a reactor. The energy stream on this menu here would correspond to the amount of energy being transferred thermally from those heating coils. Steam reforming reactions require energy input. So what we're going to do is to define an energy stream here, and we're going to call this CRV100 energy, because we want to try and keep the temperature of the reactor at 900 degrees C or thereabouts. Note that the reactor requires two material streams as outlet. It requires a liquid outlet whether physically there is one present or not. For this particular example, there are no liquids produced, but we still need to give this model the option to have a liquid material stream exiting. And so both of these needs, streams need defining. So I'm going to define my vapor stream, CRV100 vapor, and my liquid stream, CRV100 liquid, and press enter. The next thing we're guided to is it says here we need a reaction set. So I'm going to single left click on the reactions tab. I see that the box up here says reaction set. I'm going to down arrow and global reaction set is there defined. Now I'm going to single left click that and you will see there my methane reforming reaction is there with all its data. And now it just says unknown duty. If however I down single left clicked on that global reaction set on this reaction set box here and there was nothing listed the error we've made is that we've forgotten to attach a fluid package to my reaction set. This is very easy to remedy. If I wanted to remedy it from this screen right now, I would go and click on this icon here, which is enter basis environment, and I'm taken back to the screen there where we defined all our reactions, our thermodynamics, and our components. Reactions were the last thing that we defined, and so the basis manager is already open on that screen. 
and I would check this box here to see whether there is an associated thermodynamic description, an associated fluid package for this reaction set. I can see that here there is one, it's basis one. If there wasn't, I would single left click global reaction set and just say add to fluid package. Since there is one here, however, I'm going to return to the simulation environment by pressing on the button that states exactly that. So the final thing we have to solve here is the duty of the reactor. Now let's say that there is zero kilowatts of energy being added to this reactor. So rather than click on a temperature outlet, I'm going to click on the energy stream and say, don't supply any heat. Ah, now if I do that, we have an error, unable to find an adiabatic solution to reactor operation. This is because these reactions are so endothermic that they would consume all the energy required to take the stream down to absolute zero. And so we need to specify an outlet temperature of this stream such we can figure out how much heat input these reactions are required to sustain. The reality is that mechanically this set of reactions will be done in a furnace. You would have a number of very long reaction tubes containing probably a catalyst embedded in a flame box. And so what we need to do is to figure out that. So I'm going to remove this heat flow, just delete it. I'm going to single left click on material stream that exits. And I'm going to say, well, let's make this reaction isothermal and see what happens. So 900 degrees C is my temperature. Everything is calculated and the energy required is around six megawatts. So it's a fairly energy consuming process. Let's just check. We have a molar flow of liquid, which is very unusual. And so if we see something like that, we need to investigate it. So if we double click on this material stream and double click on the composition, we will see if we just expand this box a little bit here, we can see what is liquid phase. And interestingly, at these pressures, methane has gone into the liquid phase. So the fact that we have a prediction of liquid methane in our reacting system here um, prompts us to think that our thermodynamic model is indeed wrong. If we consult the literature, we find that the critical point for methane is 46 bar and about minus 83 degrees C. So clearly we are under the critical pressure at 25 bar. So we would expect all the material coming out of this system to be in the gas phase. So what we have is a problem with our thermodynamic description. We chose the non-random two liquid model. Clearly it is not suitably tuned for methane at these pressures. So what we're going to do is we're going to change our thermodynamic model and we're going to do so by re-entering our basis environment by single left clicking on this icon here. And we're going to, in our simulation basis manager, go to fluid packages. We're going to view the existing definition, which was for NRTL. We're going to select activity coefficient models, and we're going to select a more sophisticated model, which is called UNIQUAC, Universal Quasi Chemical. This is a group contribution method. Now that that's selected, we're going to return to our simulation environment. We are, don't want to be left in a holding environment when we do that. And this flow sheet will have automatically recalculated everything now using the new simulation basis. And we can see if we mouse over the liquid stream now, there is, as expected, zero kilomoles per hour of flow. If we mouse over the vapor, we'll see we have 446 kilomoles per hour of flow. And if we were to look at the mass flow, of material here, it's 4.3 tonnes per hour. If we look at the mass inflows, we find we have 2.7 and 1.6 tonnes per hour, which means that our mass balance has indeed been consistently carried out. So now that we've resolved the thermodynamic problem, we are now going to examine what's coming out of our reacting system. So we're going to double click the material stream we're going to look at the composition and we'll see that there's a little bit of unreacted methane, which is no surprise because we said there's a 98% conversion. We'll see we've got carbon monoxide and hydrogen in that three to one ratio, and we've got unreacted water.
Now, of course, we could just put less water into the reaction, but some excess water here is very useful to illustrate another point. So what we're going to do now is we're going to cool this gas stream down and condense out the water. And then we're going to separate the water from the gas. So what we're going to do is to put a cooler on our flow sheet. And as we did with the intercoolers in the compressors, we're going to give them an inlet, which is going to be for the material stream CRV100 vapor, an energy stream, and an outlet, a pressure drop of 20 kPa, and then we have an unknown duty error. That unknown duty we can figure out by specifying a material property. So I could, for example, say, put the phase fraction to zero. If I do that, note the temperature, minus 235 degrees C. What the simulator is doing here is liquefying all these chemical species, which is precisely what we don't want it to do. We are not producing liquid carbon monoxide, liquid hydrogen. So a vapor fraction of zero would be an incorrect specification now that we have this species mixture. What we're going to do instead is to say, well, if I'm using a combination of heat exchangers, just denoted by this single heat exchanger, I might have some heat recovery going on. The final cooling step is likely to be done with, for example, cooling water, which might be at 20 degrees C. I might have a 10 degrees C temperature approach between the water and the gas, maybe a 15 degrees C temperature approach. Let's take 15 as a worst case, which means that this outlet temperature here is going to be 35 degrees C. That gives me a vapor fraction now of 0.885. Now, we don't know how much water this corresponds to yet until we actually dis physically specify a separation vessel. Now, a separation vessel is this top left icon on the pallet here. So we're going to single click that and put it under the flow sheet. And then we're going to double click it and connect it. And it requires some inlets. We're only going to specify one inlet, which is our multi-phase mixture coming in. We're going to give it a vapor outlet. And we're going to give it a liquid outlet. And we'll see that that is sufficient to satisfy the vessel specification. We haven't attached an energy stream here, so we have no degree of freedom to change the temperature. The temperature will be whatever equilibrium calculates it to be. So we're going to close that window. We're going to align the icons here just to make this nice and easy to read. And again, we're going to mouse over. And if we mouse over the liquid flow, it's 51 kilomoles per hour. If we mouse over the vapor flow, it's about 395 kilomoles an hour. Now let's look at that liquid composition, double clicking on that material stream and going to composition, we find that it is 99.8% water with a smidge of dissolved carbon monoxide and hydrogen. Now whether these dissolved values are realistic is again an artifact of our thermodynamic calculation and would need checking if it's deemed to be important. Let's have a look at my vapor stream and I'll find that the composition is 0.5% methane, 25% CO, 75% hydrogen, and 0.2% water. That 0.2% water there is the vapor pressure that would be exerted under these conditions. Remember, just because we've cooled the water vapor down to 35 degrees C doesn't mean that it's got zero vapor pressure. There will still be water vapor present, albeit in small amounts. And so if we wanted to get rid of this water entirely, we would actually need a further desiccation step to absorb the water, which is actually quite expensive. So we're going to leave this material stream as it is with this 75% hydrogen, 25% carbon monoxide on a molar basis. And the final thing we're going to investigate is how we recycle this liquid water back into our process to save it.